Greetings, and welcome to another training workshop by the Pepperidge Farm Owners Association of America. Today, we're going to explore some basic business law principles by exploring the context for our association's objections to a proposed class action settlement. More precisely, the context of today's presentation centers on the California, Illinois, and Massachusetts employment misclassification class actions, which were consolidated in a California federal trial court because the parties decided to settle the wage-related claims. We're going to consider a few basic business law concepts to help you better understand both the status of those cases and why you should care. If you're just now learning about the class action cases, you need to know that there were three employment misclassification class action complaints filed, one in Massachusetts, another in Illinois, and a third in California. All three complaints contend that the defendant, Pepperidge Farm, instituted unfair policies and practices to control distributors to such an extent that they're actually employees of Pepperidge Farm, and therefore they're entitled to the statutory benefits of employment under the applicable state laws. In other words, frustrated distributors filed lawsuits in an effort to stop Pepperidge Farm's predatory policies and practices by demanding reimbursement for overtime, meals, vacations, business expenses, basically the same types of compensation and benefits that Pepperidge Farm pays its employees. To be fair, the defendant, Pepperidge Farm, denies liability for any of the causes of action alleged because all versions of its existing consignment contracts include a provision that expressly provides that franchise and distributorship owners are independent contractors, which is the exact opposite of employees. And all of the named plaintiffs signed the consignment contracts acknowledging their independent contractor status. Before we delve into any details, however, we need to make a few things crystal clear. If you're a current distributor operating in California, Illinois, or Massachusetts, whether or not you want to opt in, opt out, or object to the proposed class settlement is a decision for you and for you alone. Although you should be capable of making decisions about your business without expensive legal advice, we understand why you might want the help of an attorney to consider how best to proceed in this relatively complicated and important matter. We encourage you to consult with your lawyer. Please, get a legal opinion about the efficacy of the proposed class settlement. If you operate your business in any of the other 47 states, you might want to consider hiring an attorney or joining POAA in seeking permission from the court to intervene and object to the proposed class settlement for reasons that we'll address in just a few minutes. To be clear, this presentation is for informational purposes only. If you need or want legal advice, you have to hire an attorney. On that note, we want to make sure that every current owner knows that Pepperidge Farm Owners Association of America is a not-for-profit business league. Our slogan is, Protect Your Future. We exist for the betterment of the 4,000 small business owners operating through a Pepperidge Farm consignment contract. We grant a free basic membership to every current owner of an exclusive Pepperidge Farm franchise or an exclusive Pepperidge Farm distributorship. Simply visit our social media outlets and join the discussion. Any current owner interested in our value-added services, please visit teampoaa.org to learn more about our paid membership levels. Anyone interested in providing in-kind and or financial support to POAA, please do not hesitate to use our contact page. It's super simple to connect with us, and we'd love to know what's on your mind. Some of you will remember this slide from a POAA training workshop from a couple years ago, which, appropriately enough for today, introduced this very idea within a completely different context. What is good enough? Just think about the question for one second, and I bet most of you flip the words around to answer the original question with another question. Is what good enough? If you think about it a little more, you'll probably come up with a couple more questions like, what do you mean by good? How do you measure enough? Which is precisely the point of this context presentation. The words we use to communicate our ideas are generally good enough to convey simple concepts. But the words that we commonly use in casual conversations are often imprecise which is one of the reasons it can be so difficult for us to share all the nuances of complex concepts without first establishing a sufficiently detailed context, which typically requires that we ask a lot of questions and ultimately agree to specific definitions 
of inherently imprecise terms like satisfactory. How do you measure satisfactory service? Satisfactory to whom? Suffice it to say that language is extremely flexible because our words are merely an approximation of our compressed thoughts. And the words that we use too often do not actually mean what we really intended them to mean, which is why interpreting the original intent of the language in contracts or the true meaning of the terms and conditions in a proposed class settlement is such a tricky business. Please bear that in mind as we plow through the slides today. The context for today's presentation is to analyze the proposed settlement of the employment misclassification class actions in California, Illinois, and Massachusetts, and to establish the context, to provide an explanation why POAA hired a law firm, Fox Rothschild, to object to it. But we need to get one thing straight right from the start. POAA does not object to Pepperidge Farm paying money to settle the wage-related employment misclassification class actions. We only object to Pepperidge Farm dangling that money to hook distributors on a really awful, drastically different new form of contractual relationship with it. And we'll explain that more in detail. We know that the agenda for today looks like some pretty dull stuff. And you probably think an introductory business law lecture will not be good enough to keep you awake for the next minute, let alone keep your attention until we get to the call to action. But please do not let this agenda scare you away. It seems like a pretty safe bet to say that Pepperidge Farm executives have suffered through at least an introductory business law class or two. And I promise you, we expended a lot of effort to transform these seemingly boring topics into an interesting and informative presentation. Okay, everybody, please stay in your seats, hang on to your hats, and let's try to make some sense of all this legalese so you can decide whether to opt in, opt out, or object to the proposed class settlement. And without further ado, Business Law 101. The first rule of small business that you need to know is the law of the jungle. Big fish eat little fish. Current distributors operate small businesses based on a contractual relationship with a multi-billion dollar subsidiary of a large cap, publicly traded global company that's clearly overreacting to the shifting landscape of the so-called retail apocalypse, and is apparently determined to increase its own margins by feeding on the very sales and distribution network that helped make Pepperidge Farm the crown jewel of Campbell Soup Company. Make no mistake about it. Business competition is brutal. The mortality rate for startup companies is pretty grim. And Pepperidge Farm survived its startup phase not because it offered the best things in sliced bread. That was already done by the time they opened their first factory in the late 1940s. Pepperidge Farm survived because its original franchisees were pioneers who trailblazed through established retail markets selling the benefits of the direct store delivery model during a time when emerging supermarket chains dictated terms through their control of the central warehouse distribution model, which is the subject for another talk. For today, suffice it to say that Pepperidge Farm has grown into a very big fish, and that big fish has been tricking and intimidating current owners into voluntarily becoming smaller and smaller fish, who can no longer depend on Pepperidge Farm's corporate coattails for protection because, like so many big fish before it, Pepperidge Farm has embraced predatory practices which were accurately but incompletely alleged in the employment misclassification complaints. Now that we know the first rule of business, we can't forget that it's important to ask a lot of questions. And you're probably wondering, well, what's the current status of the three class action cases? Well, the parties consolidated the cases in a California federal trial court to seek preliminary approval to settle the employment misclassification claims. The next question for many of you probably is, so what? Let the Greek mythology lovers and lawyers figure it out. I want to know how much money am I going to get and when am I going to get it? Well, not so fast. I wish it was that simple, but it's not. The monetary payoff is only half of the proposed class settlement. As it turns out, the money's tied to the other half of the proposed settlement, which terminates your existing contract and automatically replaces it with the drastically different new form of consignment contract. It's also important for everyone to know that under the proposed terms and conditions of the class settlement, every member of the class, that's all current owners from California, Illinois, and Massachusetts, 
Every member of the class is automatically deemed to opt in. And every current owner who does not properly opt out, quote, shall be deemed to have executed and agreed to be bound by the revised consignment agreement, end quote. So even if a current owner fails to properly opt out or simply does nothing, they're still bound by the terms of the settlement, including the new contract. Even if an owner refuses to deposit the settlement check, Pepperidge Farm will keep half those monies, the other half will revert back to the settlement fund, and that owner is still bound to the radically different new form of contract. So current owners who are members of the class can't just take the money and run because the money's tied to the new form of contract. We've said it many times before, but it's worth repeating here. No one should know your business better than you. Your business is governed by a consignment contract. Therefore, you must know the true meaning and intent of the terms and conditions of your contract because it establishes the rights and responsibility of the parties to the contract. That's you and Pepperidge Farm. Which is why the POAA board is urging every current owner in the country to read the new proposed contract. Determine for yourself whether there are any material differences between the existing contract that you own and the new contract that Pepperidge Farm went to the court to approve. Find out for yourself, are there really new benefits that are being granted to current owners? Are there any new benefits to Pepperidge Farm? Why does the big fish want a new contract with the little fish? We learned the first rule of small business is the law of the jungle. Big fish eat little fish. We also learned that asking and answering a lot of questions can help us develop a sufficiently detailed context to understand the nuances of complex concepts like the terms and conditions of a new form of contract. And believe it or not, the simple process of asking and answering a lot of questions has a pretty fancy name. It's called the Socratic Method. And it's a common teaching technique used in law schools to promote critical thinking. It's developed by an ancient Greek philosopher named Socrates. And another important thing that Socrates taught us about the Socratic Method is that wisdom begins with the definition of terms. Although the U.S. legal system is really complicated, we only need to know that it can be categorized into two basic areas of law, substantive law and procedural law. The substantive law defines how the facts of a lawsuit are handled. Procedural law defines the processes that determine whether or not a lawsuit can even proceed to a trial on the merits, or in like our case today, whether a pending class action can even settle. Substantive laws touch almost every aspect of our existence, from what information must be on our birth certificates to the requirement that we be educated as children to the filing of our death certificates and the disposition of our most precious assets, like our family businesses. There's a substantive law. And the substantive law relevant here is that all three employment misclassification class action complaints contend that Pepperidge Farm instituted unfair policies and practices to control distributors to such an extent that they're actually employees of Pepperidge Farm, and therefore they're entitled to the statutory benefits of employment under the applicable state law. None of the complaints includes a claim for breach of contract, yet the money to settle the wage-related claims is tied to the proposed new contract. The lawyers argue that current owners need the numerous new and different contract provisions better protect them from Pepperidge Farm, which apparently will continue its predatory practices without the new form of contract. In our view, that's a pile of poppycock. Anyone who fully understands the material differences among the various existing forms of consignment contract will also know that the proposed revised consignment agreement actually enables Pepperidge Farm to expand the very type of unfair policies and practices that started the employment misclassification lawsuits in the first place. The federal rules of procedure prohibit parties to a class action lawsuit from just settling the case without an order from the court that approves the proposed terms and conditions of the settlement because it will impact the rights and responsibility of all members of the class, not just the parties to the case. But for now, you really only need to know that there are three stages to the class settlement approval process. Preliminary approval, notice, and final approval. 
Number one, the parties need the court to grant its preliminary approval of the proposed class settlement. If the court denies its preliminary approval, then the litigation continues. But if the court grants its preliminary approval, move to step two. And the parties must notify every member of the class about the basic terms and conditions of the settlement so they can decide whether to opt in, opt out, or object. After the notice period expires, we reach step three, where the parties then need the court to grant its final approval of the class settlement, at which time the litigation ends. Okay, well, how does the court determine whether or not it will grant approval of a class settlement? Well, there are approval standards. The court must determine whether or not a proposed class settlement is fair, reasonable, and adequate. But what does that really mean? Wisdom begins with the definition of terms, so let's define these terms. Fair is a result that affords no undue advantage to either party. It's a balanced and impartial outcome. Reasonable is a relative term that applies to that which is appropriate for a particular situation, for a particular context. Adequate is sufficient. It's equal to that which is required and suitable to the case or occasion being considered, again, to the context. So the court here is going to determine whether the proposed class settlement is fair, reasonable, adequate in the context of the employment misclassification class actions. In addition, the court must determine whether or not the proposed class settlement is the result of fully informed, non-collusive arm's length negotiations because Sadly, history has taught us that class representatives and class counsel are susceptible to the vagaries of the human condition, just like the rest of us. Sometimes litigants and lawyers can't escape the impulse to take shortcuts and to not study the context of a case completely. Or even worse, they'll expend effort working secretly with defendants and defense counsel to make a quick buck by agreeing to a bad deal for class members under the guise of fair, reasonable, and adequate proposed settlement. And that's why the approval standards include the requirement that the proposed settlement be the result of fully informed, non-collusive, arm's length negotiations. An easy way to understand the terms and conditions of the proposed class settlement is to create a list of pros and cons. But before we present the board's list of pros and cons, we want you to know the second rule of small business. The devil's in the details. And working through the details is like wading through the weeds. You need to be aware that there's often danger lurking in the weeds, especially when you're looking to ink a deal with a large predator. From the board's perspective, the pros of the proposed class settlement are pretty simple. The employment misclassification cases in California, Illinois, and Massachusetts will end without a ruling that we're actually employees of Pepperidge Farm. Although the board was unanimous that we needed to take some kind of legal action to try to stop Pepperidge Farms' unfair policies and practices, there was a difference of opinion about whether the employment misclassification approach would actually help current owners. And many of us were opposed to the outcome being sought in those cases from the start, because if we won, we didn't want to be employees of Pepperidge Farm. The next two pros on the list are contingent on the class council and class representatives helping us get Pepperidge Farm to drop the proposed new contract as a mandate to accept the fair, reasonable, and adequate amount of money to settle the wage-related claims. So presuming the case can settle with just the proposed monetary relief and not the proposed new contract requirement, then yeah, we want to make sure that the class attorneys and the class representatives get paid for their time and effort to hold Pepperidge Farm to account for its predatory practices. And the fourth pro we see is that former owners, like former POAA President Mike Green from Massachusetts, will receive a modest financial windfall for having suffered from Pepperidge Farm's unfair policies and practices. And as you see, that the four pros we see all have to do with the money. Likewise, the four major negatives that the board see all center on the requirement that current owners be automatically bound to the radically different new form of contract. The proposed monetary payoff of the wage-related claims is only nuisance value, which typically is good enough for a release of wage-related claims. 
Wisdom begins with the definition of the term. So we're going to define nuisance value and releases in just a second. But the point is, the monetary payoff here is for a release of the wage-related claims and to automatically bind current owners to a radically different new form of contractual relationship with Pepperidge Farm. According to the unopposed motion and memorandum of law filed with the court, there are over 876 current owners, class members in California, Illinois, and Massachusetts. And that represents greater than 21% of Pepperidge Farm's entire distribution network, which raises red flags for the board because Pepperidge Farm will in effect be getting a judicial mandate that the revised consignment agreement is an adequate, fair, reasonable replacement for the more valuable greens and the early blues or yellow. And that we're concerned, as we mentioned before, that Pepperidge Farm will never again give its requisite written approval for a father to transfer his green to his son or for a mother to split a blue with her daughter. Because Pepperidge Farm will say, a court has approved this as a fair, adequate, and reasonable replacement for the greens and for the blues. When in reality, if you read the proposed new contract, we're sure you will agree that it's a radically different new form of consignment agreement that does not better protect you than your existing agreements. What is nuisance value? Well, to understand nuisance value, you need to know that most cases settle without a full-blown trial on the merits of the case. And many of those cases settle for a steep discount on the total amount of exposure alleged. So for example, if a case claimed that somebody owed $100 and they settled for 50 cents, that would be considered a nominal payment known as nuisance value. It's a term used by insurance claims adjusters and attorneys to describe the amount of compensation they're willing to pay to make litigation go away without a trial. Nuisance value payments are relatively nominal amounts of money paid when a defendant's liability is still unproven or when an insurance adjuster or a defense attorney believes that the victim's damages are questionable. Why does the board think that the 20 plus million that Pepperidge Farms offering to pay to settle this case is nuisance value? Well, because that's exactly what the unopposed motion and memorandum of law says. Class counsel filed an unopposed motion seeking preliminary approval of the court to settle the employment misclassification claims, to settle the wage related claims. And the unopposed motion means that Pepperidge Farm agrees with the following quote. Pepperidge Farm maintains that plaintiff's claims are without merit, that distributors operate bona fide independent contractors under the existing consignment agreements with the company, and that they're not owed any damages, and that plaintiff's claims are inappropriate for class treatment, end quote. That's the epitome of nuisance value. The board believes that the 20 plus million that Pepperidge is offering to pay to settle the wage-related claims is nuisance value because that's what they told the court. Circling back to our original question, what is nuisance value? Well, it's $22.5 million for Pepperidge Farm to settle the wage-related claims in California, Illinois, and Massachusetts at an incredibly steep discount. I know it seems like a big amount of money because it is, and most small business owners like us couldn't just cut a check for $22.5 million to settle a lawsuit, even if that amount was only pennies on the dollar of our total exposure. But we need to apply what we've been discussing today to establish the appropriate context. It's no mystery that Pepperidge Farm is the crown jewel of Campbell Soup Company. Campbell Soup Company is a large cap publicly traded company with a market capitalization worth 13 to 17 billion dollars, depending on the fluctuations in the stock market. $17 billion is $17,000 million which is a lot more than $22.5 million. When you consider the proposed monetary relief to settle the wage-related claims within that context, you can understand how $22.5 million is still nuisance value. And the main point is that the parties told the court that the payment is nuisance value. As we already mentioned, most cases settle, and many of those cases settle for nuisance value. It's a, it's a common thing. But nuisance value payments are typically used to lure cases out of the courts through a legal device known as a release. And there are two common types of release, specific release and general release. A release is the legal industry's way 
for the parties to settle risky and flimsy cases. Release is just a general term for a legal device that the parties use to ensure that litigation is terminated when they reach a compromise, when they settle the case. A specific release is a legal device that typically applies only to the specific acts in dispute, the specific problems that are alleged in the complaint. A general release typically applies to any and all known and unknown claims that a plaintiff might have against a defendant. So a specific release is very specific and a general release is very general. There are two different contexts. Here's another quote from the unopposed motion parties file with the court. Class members who do not opt out of the settlement will release all wage and hour claims based on the alleged existence of an employment relationship between class members and Pepperidge Farm that were asserted or could have been asserted based on the facts alleged. The named plaintiffs agree to a general release of claims. Okay, you said it was common. Nuisance value payment in exchange for releases. Yeah, absolutely. Good enough? Well, it should be, but it's not for Pepperidge Farm. Why not? Well, because the nuisance value payment here isn't just for specific releases from all class members and a general release from the named plaintiffs. It also requires that you be automatically bound to the proposed new contract. Let's just pause here for a moment for a quick review before we move into the next section. Here are a couple of humorous definitions from the Devil's Dictionary. It's meant to serve as a reminder that words are elastic mere interpretations of our thoughts, until they're precisely defined. But even a seemingly exact definition can alter the most common meaning of a word, like compromise. Even changing one character from your consignment contract, one letter change, can result in a radically different new form of a deal, a radically different character of the deal. So for example, if I subtract one letter from your consignment commission, I can change a 20% commission into a 2% commission, and that would change the character of the deal in favor of Pepperidge Farm. And likewise, if I just added one letter to your consignment contract, I can change a 20% commission into a 200% commission, and that would change the character of the deal substantially in favor of the current distributors. So the point here is that even seemingly small alterations to a contract can change the character of the contract in extreme ways. We can change the character of the deal with minor additions and subtractions. And the point is, that like the parties, the POAA board wants to settle these class action cases. We do not object to the proposed monetary relief because we believe that nuisance value is fair, reasonable, and adequate for releases of the wage-related claims. But we also believe that the nuisance value payments are not fair, reasonable, and adequate for the releases of wage-related claims and the additional requirement for a drastically different, radically different form of contract. And as we'll see, there are substantial additions and subtractions to the provisions of the existing contracts, and that's what we object to. The board simply does not believe that Pepperidge Farm wants to buy back all existing businesses in California, Illinois, and Massachusetts to better protect current owners. We believe that there are also substantial new rights that Pepperidge Farm is trying to gain for itself through the proposed class settlement process. But we're jumping ahead. In fairness, we want to compare how the lawyers in the class action case characterize the proposed new contract versus how the board characterizes the proposed new contract. And to do that, we should bear in mind that wisdom begins with the definition of terms. And it's time for us to really wise up and start defining a lot of terms. And the first term we're going to define is characterization. It means a description of the distinctive nature or the main features of something or someone. The unopposed motion and memorandum of law filed with the court present class counsel's and Pepperidge Farm's arguments in favor of the new revised contracts. The lawyers characterize the substantial amendments and the numerous material changes to the existing consignment contracts as merely revised contract agreement, rather than calling it for what it is, which is a radically new form of contractual relationship with Pepperidge Farm. If you take a look at the definition of revised, it means to make alterations to something written or printed, to reconsider, to re-examine, to amend, 
To revise is to make alterations. Alterations is defined as change or cause to change in character or composition, typically in a comparatively small but significant way. And we know that altering even one character of the consignment contract can radically change the character of the deal. Indeed, the revised consignment agreement that's being required to settle the wage-related claims will cause significant changes to the existing contractual relationships between Pepperidge Farm and current distributors because there are so many numerous and substantial alterations that re result in a radically new form of consignment contract. Why does the board believe that? Well, because that's exactly what the unopposed motion seeking preliminary approval of the proposed class settlement says. The following slides are actually copied and pasted directly from the unopposed motion. But before we get into the specific list of the main features, before we get into the characterization of the new contract by class counsel and Pepperidge Farm, you need to know that it raised red flags for the board to read that the addition and subtraction of numerous contractual provisions only grant new rights to the distributors without any characterization of new rights being granted to Pepperidge Farm. So we're going to need to determine for ourselves whether or not the proposed new contract really just provides extra protections from Pepperidge Farm's undue control over current distributors, or whether the proposed new contract also grants Pepperidge Farm substantial new rights. You know, I think you'll be surprised to know that it does. If we take a look at the first bullet point, a provision requiring Pepperidge Farm to provide current distributors with advanced notice of any product it wishes to allocate to current distributors beyond what they've ordered. Well, that's a new right for Pepperidge Farm. Under the existing consignment contracts, paragraph two, under the existing consignment contracts, Pepperidge Farm only can allocate product when demand exceeds its production capacity. It has no right to allocate any product it wishes to allocate beyond what distributors have ordered. Some of you are probably thinking that the board's making a mountain out of a molehill with this first bullet point from the motion. You're probably thinking, well, so what? Pepperidge Farm's been direct shipping pallets and allocating product as much as it wishes for years now. Why not just give them the right in the new contract? Because at least now we'll have the right to notice before they do it. And if you actually read the proposed new contract, current distributors will have the right to object when Pepperidge Farm wants to allocate product. But the board believes that those rights to notice and objection are illusory because the objections go to Pepperidge Farm. And you're asking Pepperidge Farm to reconsider and determine whether or not its first exercise of business judgment was commercially unreasonable. Is that good enough? Well, what is commercially unreasonable? Is it defined in the contract? No. And there's the rub. If Pepperidge Farm overrules your objection and just sends as much product of any product that it wishes, then what do you do? Well, we'll get into that in a minute. But first, let's take a quick look at some of the other bullet points that we copied and pasted from the motion. Express clarification that Pepperidge Farm's recommended best practices for service frequency are not a contractual obligation. Clarification that current owners have discretion to accept or reject a variety of recommendations from Pepperidge Farm. Quite frankly, the board doesn't see a need for a radically new form of contract to clarify those current rights under the existing contract. Current owners always had the right to negotiate planograms directly with local stores. Do we really need to replace the existing forms of business with the new form of business just to get a provision that expressly prohibits Pepperidge Farm from approving or disapproving the people we hire to help work our business? The board doesn't think so because under the existing contracts, you have the right to hire helpers so long as they comport themselves with the high reputation of the bakery. Well, what about the significant new rights for current distributors who wish to sell their territories? Define significant, sufficiently great or important to be worthy of attention, noteworthy. And if we give a little extra attention to the existing right to sell territories, you're going to find that the new proposed right to sell isn't more valuable than the rights you already have under the yellow and the green. The claim that they're significant new rights implies that they're new and improved, better, 
more valuable. And in reality, they're just substantially different than the existing rights. The next bullet point raised red flags for the board, and it should for you too, because the language used is meaningless. Elimination of certain language that potentially authorized Pepperidge Farm to terminate its agreement with the current distributor. What language? Certain language? If it was certain, then why is it only a potentiality? Let's define potential. Potentially, with the capacity to develop or happen in the future. A little more than a year ago, we were forced to recall potentially poisonous product that Pepperidge Farm released to us for distribution in the marketplace. We couldn't generate a penny of new revenue during the scramble to protect consumers and the Pepperidge Farm brand, but our burn rates skyrocketed while our sales commissions ground to a halt. Out of an understandable abundance of caution, accounts demanded that we recall every SKU, not just the tainted SKU. So we shouldered the extra carrying cost of the non-recalled fresh product, and we at least doubled our cost to serve by rotating the untainted fresh product back into accounts over the ensuing weeks. And then adding insult to injury, Pepperidge Farm still automatically assessed thousands of dollars in chargebacks for allegedly excessive amounts of stale returns during that quarter, as though it was business as usual. Although Pepperidge Farm undoubtedly suffered some short-term financial losses in connection with the recall, it will likely recoup all of those financial losses from the supplier, and we will not. So the next bulletin point about a 2% commission on the recalled product, is that good enough? Board doesn't think so. Quite frankly, the next bullet point seems meaningless too. A provision allowing current distributors to seek financial relief from Pepperidge Farm on its product is damaged through no fault of their own. So what? You have the right to seek financial relief from Pepperidge Farm under the existing contracts. In fact, the new OSD, Over Shortages and Damage Procedure, allows you to get financial relief when the product arrives damaged through no fault of your own. And if you need to seek financial relief because of a problem account with a lot of damage, you already have the right to do it. We don't need a brand new form of contract and a brand new form of contractual relationship to be able to seek financial relief. There's no guarantee that they're going to let you find it. Which brings us to the last bullet point, the last item in the list of main features, the last characterization in the unopposed motion from class counsel and Pepperidge Farm about the new form of business relationship. And the last item is a new alternative dispute resolution process, including mandatory arbitration. Well, the proposed new contracts present several pages of convoluted terms and conditions for mandatory arbitration. If the number of pages devoted to dividing contractual rights and responsibilities is any indication of its importance, then mandatory arbitration must be extremely important to Pepperidge Farm because its complex provisions are as long, if not longer, than the entire existing contracts. And the provisions incorporate by reference volumes of additional rules and regulations applicable to arbitration proceedings under the for-profit rules of jams. It's important for everyone to know, current owners to know, that there's absolutely nothing in the existing contracts that prohibits the parties from voluntarily agreeing to voluntary arbitration. Given that Pepperidge Farm is apparently so keen on arbitration, all they need to do is offer it to you as an alternative way to resolve whatever controversy exists. And if your lawyer advises you to do so, you can accept the offer. Indeed, arbitration can be faster and a more affordable way to resolve legal disputes because it relaxes the rules of procedure, the rules of evidence used by the trial courts. The discovery phase is typically the most expensive aspect of litigation, and the less stringent rules of many arbitration proceedings can streamline the discovery phase and otherwise help to reduce the litigation costs for both parties. The board received reports that many current owners believe that the mandatory arbitration provision is great because Pepperidge Farm will pay for the entire mandatory arbitration process, which is not true. You need to read the new contract provisions. You need to talk to your lawyer about them because the fact is, under the proposed new mandatory arbitration, Pepperidge Farm will pay a couple hundred bucks to cover the filing fees for the arbitration proceedings to commence, but every current 
distributor is still on the hook to pay a couple hundred bucks an hour for each and every attorney and paralegal that represents them in the proceedings against Pepperidge Farm. On that note, the board urges every current owner to get their attorney to give them an opinion about mandatory arbitration and ask, is it true that mandatory arbitration often is more complex and costly than litigation in trial courts, depending on the rules and the regulations governing the arbitration proceedings. As many of you may already know from recent POAA newsletters with links to various news outlets with articles discussing how big companies are ruining small businesses through mandatory arbitration provisions. Big fish eat little fish. And the devil's in the details. We'll introduce the third and final rule of small business for today in just a minute. But first, Every current owner needs to understand mandatory arbitration means that you voluntarily abdicate your constitutional right to access the Article III court system, that you're voluntarily walking away from the U.S. judicial system in favor of these unduly complicated arbitration provisions instead of under the existing contract, voluntarily agreeing to arbitration when it makes sense to you and your attorney to resolve a controversy. And some of you are probably thinking, well, big deal. None of us can afford to litigate against Pepperidge Farm anyway. They've got the resources to buy the best legal minds and most talented advocates on the planet. Many of you may remember that Pepperidge Farm crushed the association in litigation by racking up our legal fees through a protracted discovery process and pretrial motions. And after we spent $750,000 with the Dady Law Firm, the court dismissed our case before it was even considered on the merits of the claims. So Pepperidge Farm escaped liability again without paying a single penny for its wrongdoing. And then they spent the next few years expanding their unfair policies and practices even further. So you're absolutely right. None of us can afford to litigate against Pepperidge Farm on our own. And Pepperidge Farm is banking on that fact. But now it's offering to pay a few pennies on the dollar to settle wage-related claims because the U.S. judicial system certified the complaints as class. Hallelujah. But the cases really only scratched the surface of Pepperidge Farm's predatory practices. Our only prayer to stop the continuing unfair policies and practices of Pepperidge Farm is through another class action, like the employment misclassification class actions that got us to this point in the first place. But the new contract, which isn't disclosed in the motion and memorandum here, also prohibits you from even participating in another class action ever again. Is that good enough? The board doesn't think so. The board understands that some current owners trust Pepperidge Farm completely, implicitly, without question, and that some current owners trust Pepperidge Farm will not abuse its new right to allocate any product it wishes in any amounts it wishes whenever it wants, because they have the new right to object and that they trust Pepperidge Farm will consider objections to the proposed allocations in a commercially reasonable way. And some current owners trust that the mandatory arbitration really is better for them than voluntarily agreeing to arbitration under the existing contracts. And in response, the board wants to introduce the third rule of small business. It's printed right on our money, and we're in business to make money. In God we trust, all others need to be verified. Many current owners, just like many small business owners, will give their trust based on their feelings, instinct, that they go by their gut. And that's not to say that your instinct shouldn't be a factor to take into consideration. But how do you trust? Why do you trust Pepperidge Farm will even pay consignment sales commissions under the proposed new contract? There's no provision in the new contract about how you're going to get paid. What's more important to a consignee than how consignment sales commissions are calculated? Why did the parties make it such a priority to have express clarification that Pepperidge Farm recommendations are not contractual obligations and that a current distributor can seek financial relief when there are problems through no fault of their own? But the parties didn't think it was a priority to expand or clarify the definition of bulletin prices which historically were the wholesale prices in the industry standard bulletin price list 
that Pepperidge Farms stopped publishing for the bakery division in 2012, and they stopped publishing for the snacks division in 2015, a connection with a scheme to have trade promotions without trade spend. What does that mean? doesn't mean anything. You can't have a trade promotion without trade spend. And the reality is, is that the trade spend budget is being subsidized by skimming commissions from distributors because Pepper's Farm is manipulating the wholesale prices on the invoices and paying off of invoice instead of the price bulletin lists. Parties and their lawyers knew or should have known. There's no provision in the consignment contracts that's more important to current consignees, current owners, than how their consignment sales commissions are calculated. Yet it's not part of the characterization that was presented to the court in the unopposed motion, and it's not addressed in any way, shape, or form in the proposed new contract. Please, we urge you to read the proposed new contract, talk to your lawyer about it and determine for yourself whether it makes sense to be automatically bound to the proposed new form of contractual relationship with Pepperidge Farm when the proposed terms and conditions don't provide any clarity about how you as a consignee will be able to earn consignment sales commissions, or whether it makes more sense for you to advise the court that you do not object to the nuisance value payments in exchange for releases of the wage-related claims the context of the proposed class settlement, but you object to the proposed new form of contractual relationship with Pepperidge Farm because it doesn't really provide you with better protections from their unfair policies and practices. Pepperidge Farm Owners Association of America's legal committee determined that the proposed monetary relief is fair, reasonable, and adequate for the specific releases of wage-related claims but it's not fair, reasonable, and adequate to effectively terminate the existing contracts to mandate a radically new form of contractual relationship with Pepperidge Farm automatically. The board ultimately hired Fox Rothschild to help current distributors object to the proposed class settlement because the material changes to the existing contracts are so numerous and substantial that the terms and conditions of the proposed non-economic relief in the class settlement are tantamount to a termination of our existing contracts without cause. Pepperidge Farm is effectively buying back our existing businesses for the nuisance value payment of the wage-related claims and re automatically replacing our businesses with the new revised form of contractual relationship that will supposedly better protect us from Pepperidge Farm's predatory practices, but as we discussed, will actually enable them to expand their initiatives to take back margins from current distributors. Every version of the existing consignment contracts with Pepperidge Farm take into account this exact scenario. Every version of the consignment contracts includes a termination without cause provision that requires Pepperidge Farm to pay the consignee fair market value of the franchise or the distributorship plus 25% of that value. What is good enough is the amount of money, the nuisance value payment that Pepperidge Farm is offering to pay class members to settle the wage-related claims. Also, good enough to cover greater than or equal to 125% of the fair market value of your business. Only you can answer that question for your business. We're going to end the presentation today with a call to action. Call to action simple. Know your rights. Ask a lot of critical questions. Is the proposed monetary relief good enough to automatically bind you to the new contract? Well, is the new contract actually better than the existing contract? Protect your equity. Please help us raise awareness. Join the discussions. Attend our training workshops. Tune into our training videos. Become an active member of Pepper Farm Owners Association of America. Please remember the rules of small business. Big fish eat little fish. The devil's in the details. And in God we trust, everyone else gets verified. Remember that the Socratic method is just a fancy name for the simple but effective process of asking and answering a lot of questions to stimulate critical thinking and to draw out new ideas. It often involves questions that require the definition of terms, like fiduciary. The legal term that describes things involving trust, especially regarding trust relationships. 
Transparency is a key component of a fiduciary relationship. What is transparency? Openness, honesty, accountability. Socrates taught us to define terms because language is creative and extremely flexible, but inherently imprecise. Consequently, trying to ascertain the true meaning and intent of important contract terms and conditions or the terms of a proposed class settlement can be a very tricky business. Take the quote here. I see, said the blind man to his deaf dog as he picked up his hammer and saw. <laughs> Does the blind man really mean, I understand? Or is he being a jokester because he doesn't understand? Do you see? It depends on a better understanding of the context for his statement. What is the paradox of choice? Well, we've discussed this idea in previous workshops and presentations, but suffice it to say that many times less is more. And the paradox here is that the proposed monetary relief is fair, reasonable, and adequate to settle the wage-related claims, but the additional requirement to automatically bind current distributors to a new form of contraction relationship is not. Given the context, a proposed class settlement of employment misclassification class actions, given the context, less is more meaningful to current distributors than more in terms of the proposed class settlement. And that explains why Team POAA hired Fox Rothschild to help current distributors object to the proposed contract, but to support the proposed monetary relief to settle the employment misclassification cases.